Hello, good evening. Today is December 15th, 2022. I'm Bhavani Singham from the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm going to record this lecture on secure knowledge management. So if you look at my YouTube page, I do have several lectures that I've recorded. Most of them are based on my current, is most of the lectures are based on my current work. And a few of them are based on sort of my earlier work. So they are more for historical purposes because I believe that it's always good to capture, you know, what has come before, before us so that we are better equipped to tackle the challenges that we are faced with today, in particular in cybersecurity and data science. Those are my areas. So again, today's talk is on secure knowledge management. And so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I've got it all ready. Okay, so secure knowledge management. So I'm going to provide some background and about some security aspects and what are the various technologies and then I'm going to get into some related topics. Again, the way things were around 20 years ago, web security and digital libraries and some directions. Again, the purpose of this lecture is to provide a historical overview of some topics such as secure knowledge management that dominated the discussions in the late 1990s and early 2000s. A version of this lecture was initially given as an opening plenary keynote address at the inaugural Secure Knowledge Management Workshop in Buffalo, New York in September 2004. The Secure Knowledge Management Workshop was founded by two professors uh, from the State University of New York in Buffalo. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, Secure Knowledge Management was really a, a an extremely uh, popular area that was in the late 1990s and also in 2000s. It's still very important, especially it's taught in business schools. Uh, how do you sort of capture the knowledge, organize the knowledge and reuse the knowledge because the expertise and the knowledge that an organization gains or has is really important that it has to be uh, protected, it has to be captured, it has to be disseminated so that the organization can benefit. Because why do you want to re reinvent the wheel, right? So as I said, we had this workshop and I was the opening plenary speaker. I don't know whether this, uh, uh, we can check later whether this uh, link still works. So then there are also some references uh, myself uh, with two of my colleagues at the MITRE Corporation at the time, Daryl Moray and Mark Mabry. Mark Mabry was my boss and Daryl Moray was my colleague. And in fact, Daryl Moray is interesting. He, uh, after he worked in our department, then he did his uh, uh, you know, MBA, he got his MBA from Sloan School, then he joined the Boston Celtics. And now for the last probably like almost 17, 18 years, He's been, or 16, 17 years, he's been the general manager of the Houston Rockets. It's not that I want to name drop because, yes, Houston Rockets is a major basketball uh, team. Uh, but it's still good to know, to say that you know some important people. Anyway, so we also wrote a paper. This was, I think, in 2006. Uh, myself and three of my colleagues uh, Professor Latifa Khan, Professor Elisa Bertino, and Professor Ravi Sandhu. And that appeared in IEEE Transactions on System Man, System Man and Cybernetics. I think this M should be capital. Okay. So what is knowledge management? Knowledge management, or KM, is the process through which organizations generate value from their intellectual property and the knowledge-based assets. Eventually, the organization wants to generate business, improve revenue. How do you uh, take advantage of the knowledge that's there in the organization? Sometimes we may not even know that there is this knowledge in the organization. So how do you take advantage? So knowledge management involves the creation, 
dissemination and utilization of this knowledge. And I got this again several years ago from this website. Okay, so knowledge management component cycles, component cycle and technologies. So one thing I wanted to mention, when we edited the book, myself, Daryl Murray and Mark Maybury, I wanted to also, Daryl wanted to organize the book in terms of the strategies, processes, and metrics. So I told him, why don't we add a, tech, uh, a section on technology? He really knew what to do. I mean, he, he was very, very sharp. He said, no, because what could, could we have written at the time with technology, World Wide Web, the expert systems? We didn't talk about data science. We didn't have all this deep learning. So he said, technologies are going to change. So if we put technology in there, the book will become outdated. So let's focus on strategies, processes, and metrics for knowledge management. And what's the cycle of knowledge management? You create knowledge, you share knowledge, you measure knowledge, and you improve knowledge, right? So you measure, and then you see, right? Have you, uh, what are the measurements like? How can you improve? And then, of course, at that time, the technologies were expert systems, collaboration, training, and the web. Today, of course, we will be adding machine learning and data science and cybersecurity and so on. Okay, cybersecurity was there at that time because the whole workshop was about secure knowledge management. Okay, so this is something I took from Daryl Morey's one of his presentations. He source was Reiner, Reinhardt and Palowski. So this is the diffusion. Okay, so you have the metrics. It's central is the metrics. You have the diffusion right, tacit explicit knowledge, then you modify the knowledge, you take actions, you identify, so first you go to identify, diffuse, modify, take actions. Of course, you've got create knowledge, you have to integrate and then gather metrics. Metrics is going to be integrated with everything. So once you gather, gather metrics, how can you improve? That's what happens organized in organizational learning processes. Of course, there are these incentives. You've got to pe give people the incentives to share knowledge. Because remember, I'm not each one of us, we are not going to do something that uh, is not going to be appreciated or if we don't benefit. That's the human nature, right? You know, in general, we are not saints. So we do something to get something in return, right? So we need to be given incentives. Okay. So if you, if you share knowledge, if you become sort of the knowledge management person of the year, then you get maybe a check for $100, $200, whatever, okay? Or you get a promotion. Okay, so aspects of secure knowledge management. So now we are looking at, in, into this process, we need to add security, right? So secure knowledge management will include protecting the intellectual property of an organization, uh, applying various access control policies. At that time, we were looking at role-based access control, and then knowledge management is the processes, metrics, processes, and strategies. So for all the processes like workflow and so on, you've got to look at security. So users must have certain credentials to carry out certain activities. And then you have different security policies in the organization and across organizations. So how do you integrate all these security policies? And then, of course, we talk about security, uh, knowledge management strategies and processes. What are the security issues? What about risk management and economic trade-offs? And what about things like digital rights management and negotiating trust? So these are all the aspects that we focused on in our early research. So again, as I said, Daryl focused on strategies, processes, metrics in our book that we edited. So we are talking about secure knowledge management. We are not talking about any particular technology, but security techniques are also important. So security strategies, Again, policies and procedures for sharing data. What are the security policies for sharing data? How do you protect the intellectual property? Should, uh, should be tightly integrated with business strategy. You don't want your security strategy in one direction, business strategy in another direction, not talking to each other, right? They have to be closely aligned. And security processes, you have secure workflow, right? The workflow processes have to be secured processes for contracting, purchasing, order management, and so on. And what about the metrics? You've got to collect all the metrics in an organization, such as how many documents do we share, right? 
uh, how many likes that we get. So today we have social media too. That's part of knowledge management. How many likes we get for something that we share. At that time, we looked at metrics like what is the impact on the number of documents, but what is the impact of security on the number of documents published and other metrics gathered, right? So normally we would share all the information, but because of, because of security, we may not share all of the information, all of our documents. So what's the impact? And then what are some of the techniques at that time? We were focusing on access control and trust management. Okay, so now I'm sort of repeating what I said earlier, aspects of secure knowledge management in a picture, secure strategies, policies, plans, and procedures, security processes, like processes for workflow order management, contracting, what's the security impact, technologies. Uh, at that time, again, we are looking at 20 years ago, privacy pres or 18 years ago, privacy preserving data mining. Today, we'll talk about privacy aware machine learning. And that time, the web, we were very much involved with the web and semantic web. So how do you secure the semantic web and so on? The metrics, what's the security impact on the metrics gathered, like the information shared, the document shared? What are the techniques, access control and trust management and so on? And again, this was again, remember, I gave this presentation 18 years ago, and these were the things that we were, aspects we were looking at. Okay, now we have to look at the same uh, organizational learning process every step of the way. What are the restrictions on knowledge sharing by incorporating security? So again, there are incentives that are still there for sharing. So you have to identify, you've got to create knowledge, diffuse, integrate, modify, take actions. But because of security, right, the sharing process, it is very likely to be affected, right? So what are the restrictions? How is knowledge sharing impacted by incorporating security? So that's what we were trying to do uh, 18 years ago. Okay. So security policy issues for knowledge management. So the questions we asked were, what are the policies during knowledge creation? Uh, how do you represent these policies during knowledge management? So how do you represent these security policies? Uh, we were looking at uh, policy languages like XACML, that's the Extensible Access Control Markup Language and uh, Resource Description Framework and so on. And then of course, how do you enforce policies during knowledge manipulation and dissemination, right? So these were some of the aspects we were looking at. So the architecture, right? Sort of, the, I will call it the functional architecture. At the beginning, you have knowledge creation and acquisition management, right? So what are the policies for that? So again, what we talk at today, I say that policies have to be, policies have to drive, drive everything. Because more recently, we, de we developed a privacy-aware data management framework, like for our smartphones and so on. And so one of the things that we are stressing is that policies have to govern every single, uh, throughout the life cycle, right, of the information sharing process. So this is something, right, the origins to that was what I was discussing almost 20 years ago. So knowledge creation and acquisition, what are the policies? Knowledge representation, how do you represent these policies? Knowledge manipulation and sustainment, how do you enforce these policies, right? Knowledge dissemination and transfer, and what sort of policies for dissemination? So this is a cycle, and this is what I call like a functional security architecture. So when we talk about coalitions, right, they got to share knowledge, Knowledge organizations for federations and coalitions have to work together to solve a problem. Universities, commercial corporations, government agencies. So what are the challenges to share data information and at the same time ensure security and autonomy for the individual organization? So we're going to identify the challenges and how can knowledge be shared across organizations? So since I first presented this, as I said, 18 years ago, over 18 years ago. Since then, we've done a lot of work on information sharing and looking at security policies across organizations and sharing information using the cloud across countries. And we've also developed prototypes. Okay, so a coalition architecture, sort of like a federation, right? Federated architecture or coalition architecture. So you've got knowledge, component knowledge for agency A, 
agency B has some other knowledge, agency C, and then you export knowledge, just like the uh, Shet and Larson, Amit Shet and James Larson, they had the paper ACM Computing Surveys, I think back in 1990, about secure federated data management. We are borrowing from their concepts, okay? So we export the knowledge to the Federation because that depends on the policies. We are not exporting everything. Some of the knowledge the organization is exporting. Similarly, B and C, and then we build the knowledge for the coalition. They are going to share this knowledge in order to improve their process, uh, such as, you know, working on a joint problem. Uh, at that time, we were talking within the context of, you know, like the global war on terrorism or the global war on the pandemic, right? So organizations can share the knowledge that they have acquired. Okay, so what are some of the knowledge management technologies? Remember, 18 years ago, very different today. We had the data mining, mining the information and determining resources without violating security. Secure semantic web, right? Knowledge represented in semantic web technologies. And what are some of the security applications? Annotations, you've got to annotate the knowledge. So managing annotations about expertise and resources, what's the security impact? There was a lot of work on content management, right? So how do you mark up the technologies? and related aspects for managing the content. And of course, multimedia was a major aspect then. Video, audio, uh, text and animations and so on, everything integrated. Today, of course, we will be adding so many more technologies, right? Social media, and then we will be adding what? Uh, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Okay, so what are the directions? And this is sort of something that I would like to, uh, for this part of the presentation, we have identified high level aspects. That's what we talked about. Strategies, processes, metrics, techniques, technologies, architecture, and we need to investigate security issues. So at that time we were talking about role-based access control. And then Ravi Sandhu had come up with a model called UCON, usage control. And that's not really adopted these days. Now today I would use something called ABAC, attribute-based access control. RBAC is still around. Right, and it's really many organizations have implemented RBAC, open environment like a cloud, you implement ABAC, trust management and so on. And CS departments should collaborate because knowledge management is really taught, taught more in business schools. So we have a lot to work together with business schools uh, on knowledge management and secure knowledge management. So these days you can sort of use some of these aspects, knowledge management into corporate governance. Right, so I'm also into corporate governance. More recently, I've been teaching some, giving some guest lectures to, uh, you know, to corporate boards and nonprofit boards and so on on corp uh, cybersecurity governance. Okay, because one aspect of corporate governance, of course, is cybersecurity governance, and some of the knowledge management concepts could be integrated into the cybersecurity governance for, for companies and any organization. Okay, now web security, by the way, this was like 18 years old, so much has happened, right? End-to-end -end security, right? We need to secure clients, servers, networks, operating systems, transactions, data, programming, languages. Of course, some people say there's no such thing as perfect security. Of course, there's a quality of service. So what are some of the security guarantees? It's always a trade-off. The various systems when put together have to be secure. So you've got to have composable properties, you've got the databases, the applications, the object request brokers, the clouds, and the, today we'll have the IoT and so on. When you put it edge, put it all together, how do you compose all the properties? And another thing is how do you build a secure system when your components could be untrusted? Because remember, when we talk about supply chain, the parts are coming from all over the world, right? And these parts may not be secure. When you build an aircraft, right? These different parts could crash, but still the aircraft has to fly. So how do you care? How can you build a secure system? Failing means through some fault or some attack. So access control rules, enforcing security policies, auditing and intrusion detection these days. I mean, over the past 20 years, we've advanced so much. And there are security solutions provided by organizations like World Wide Web Consortium and OSIS. They came up with XACML uh, around that time. Of course, securing Java, there was a big thing at the time, firewalls, and things like digital signatures, message digests, and cryptography. 
Okay, so attacks to web security. These were some of the things I wrote in one of my books, security threats and violations, of course, access control violations, integrity violations, fraud and sabotage, denial of service and infrastructure attacks and confidentiality, authentication and non-repudiation violations, right? So all of these attacks, and now there are many more attacks now. And the web components, of course, you've got end-to-end -end security I mentioned, secure web components, all the parts have to be secure. But again, the challenge today, at that time, 20 years ago, we said we need everything secure. But today we know that it's not possible to have 100%. So we've got to carry out risk analysis, right? Risks are important. Although we would like to have secure client servers, middleware networks, databases, protocols, and so on, right? We also need to carry out risks and see what are the levels of risks and get in cyber insurance. So, so many things come into play today. And of course, then e-commerce transactions were beginning, right? It was like between 1995 and 2000, and still it was continuing into 2000 to 2005. E-commerce functions are carried out as banking and trading on the internet. Each data transaction could, could contain many tasks, and then you build database transactions on top of these data transactions. And for database transactions, like typical, typical, you know, like Oracle database transactions, uh, multi-user access to web databases, and we need concurrency control and recovery and so on. And so type of transaction systems, again, remember 20 years ago, stored account payment, credit and debit card transactions, electronic payment systems for virtual cyber cash, secure electronic transaction. We had stored valued payment, users pair certificates model after hard cash, Goal is to replace hard cash with e-cash, right? E-cash, cyber coin, and so on. Of course, so much has done has been happening today. We have Bitcoin, right? Blockchain. And we have heard so much about FTX in recent days, right? So I've been reading up all, all about that. And I've written, I've done some research on blockchain and uh, published a few papers. You know, none of it was there. And blockchain actually, Bitcoin initially proposed. I think by Nakamoto in 2006, we really don't know who this person is, right? And since then, not only it has advanced so much, now we are also trading, right? Uh, Bitcoins and so on, although I'm not so sure, you know, considering what's happened over the last few months, uh, what the future is going to be. Nevertheless, as technologies, let's at least learn what these technologies are about, right? So much has happened. And this was the, you know, 20 year ago, 20 years ago protocol, uh, that stack. So we had the TCP IP, it's still there. We had the socket protocol, but now we will have, I think, uh, TCP, TLS, transport layer service, TLS and SSL, but they are being combined together. Transport layer security and secure socket layer, they are being merged together. And we have got TLS, transport layer security with session layer security and HTTP, of course, right? Hypertext transfer protocol. Then you have the pro payment protocols and database transaction protocols, that, right? This is like, like a 20 year old stack. And now how do you bring in the exchanges and the blockchain and the Bitcoins and so on into this environment? That's important. Okay, then there was a big thing back then, digital libraries. Now it's like second nature to us. In the 1990s with the World Wide Web, right? Organizations were trying to digitize all their documents, digital libraries, like electronic libraries. Several communities have developed medical social library. The initial uh, project was National Science Foundation, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and NASA. They had got together and worked on this digital library initiative. Now, practically every organization, right, had their own digital libraries. Components, technolo component technologies like web data management, multimedia, information retrieval, indexing, browsing. Of course, today you want to add maybe social media. We want to also add what else? Uh, machine learning, deep learning. Se but the point here, security, remember, security has to be integrated into all aspects. Secure models for libraries and secure functions and so on. So closely related, these all these libraries have to store all the data in databases. So these are web-based databases. So back then, how did these data? How do these databases access the web? There was a technology called Java Database Connectivity, right? So using JDBC, initially Java application programs, right, access these web databases through JDBC, and then these JDBC sort of 
and related technologies became common so that any application can access databases. And querying, indexing, transaction management, new transaction models for e-commerce applications, indexing strat strategies for unstructured data. Of course, XML started booming at the time. It's still, we are using XML. It's a common exchange language, right? extensible markup language. So we had a lot of research on query languages and data models. It's, it's become, since XML has become the standard document inter interchange language. And of course, when you have to manage XML databases on the web, there was a lot of work on XQuery, uh, extensions to XML, uh, uh, like how do you optimize uh, query processing, right? Query and indexing strategies uh, with, say, XQuery, and then integrating heterogeneous data sources on the web, information integration, ontologies using ontologies when there is semantic heterogeneity, and of course, mining data on the web. So there was various types of mining, web content, how do you use the web usage and structure and content mining. So, and today, of course, we are going to incorporate deep learning. Machine learning is going to be all over the place here. Let's see, this is my last chart. Directions for web security. So I've talked about knowledge management, security, and now web security. And again, this was 20 years ago. End-to-end -end security, we're saying network, secure network, client service, middleware, right? Again, then we have end-to-end -end security. What are the risks? That's what we are going to, we will be focusing on today. Secure web databases, agents, information retrieval systems, browsers, search engines, all of that's still there. And as new technologies are introduced, right? How do we integrate that? That's the challenge. As technologies evolve, of course, today we have big data. But it's not that we didn't have big data then. We used to call it massive. I remember working on a big data project. We didn't call it big data. We called it massive data as early as 1993. And now, uh, 30 years later, we are talking about big data, or at least 2013, 20 years later, we started talking about big data. Massive data, we said we know how to do terabytes. We, have, we are focusing now on petabytes. Today, petabytes is like, Every day we are generating petabytes. So we are talking about zettabytes and exabytes and all kinds of bytes, right? Okay, so as technology evolves, more security problems, data mining, machine learning, intrusion detection, encryption, some of the technologies, right? And today, of course, we've got quantum computing. And with quantum computing, yes, we can maybe handle the big data problem, but quantum computing means all the encryption codes can be broken in milliseconds which means we'll have no security. That means we are focusing now on post-quantum cryptography. We absolutely have to get post-quantum cryptography correct, right? We need so many technologies because otherwise we will not have security. Next steps, back 20 years ago, secure semantic web, secure knowledge management, building trusted applications from untrusted com components. These were the things we were talking. Today, of course, we have machine learning, AI, artificial intelligence, and what happens if these machine learning techniques are attacked, right? They have to be secure, they have to, the data has to be accurate, they've got to produce accurate results, they have to be fair, they should not be biased, right? All of those aspects have to come in and we call them like machine learning, trustworthy machine learning or resilient machine learning. Okay, so let's see, that finishes my presentation. It was a, sorry, it was a fairly short presentation. I think it took about, right, not even 30 minutes. Uh, again, the main point here of this lecture is to explain what happened, right? Because why do we want to reinvent the wheel, right? So wouldn't it be great that if you know what happened, what worked, what did not work, was knowledge management a success, what can we learn from knowledge management? How can we apply you know, technologies like deep learning uh, into this knowledge management? So there's so much that we, we can learn from what we have done in the past. So again, what I always say is think of the present, right? But you can't forever live on the present, but focus on the future, plan for the future. Think of the present. That's what we've got to focus. Plan for the future. But do not forget the past in the sense, sorry, what I mean by that is we've got to learn from the past. So learn from the past and think of the present and plan for the 
future. Okay. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to end my presentation. And again, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you and bye.